This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, first up is Neil Musanti. Uh, Neil is an ANS associate member who has been collecting books of metals since the mid-1980s. Uh, he has written two books himself, uh, the medallic work of James Adams uh, Bowen and, uh, of course, Medallic Washington, which is a, a very impressive two-volume set. Uh, that goes on earlier works. Uh, in addition to membership in uh, a variety of numismatic clubs, too many to list, Neil has sat on the board for the um, Metal Collectors of, of America, MTA, uh, and he is currently at work on a book on the life and times of Charles Cushing Wright. Uh, today, Neil will present some early work of die sinker and metalist Charles Cushing Wright. So please help me welcome Neil Asante. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you to the uh, Resolute Collection, the Stacks family and the ANS for sponsoring this and having us. And uh, uh, it's been a great event so far. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Charles Cushing Wright. Most of what we know about his early life comes from uh, William Dunlop's book, um, the Rise and Progress of the Arts of Design in America. And uh, Wright was born in Damariscotta, Maine, on May 1st, 1896. His mother was named Hannah Barker Bryant. She had been previously married to a gentleman by the name of Enos Clapp. He was an older man, he was a seaman, and he was lost at sea. And when he died or never came back from sea, uh, the sea, she took her name back, uh, Hannah Barker Bryant. In about 1794, th this is family lore. This comes from the, the uh, great grandson of Charles Cushing Wright. Charles Lennox Wright did a, an amazing amount of research on his ancestor, trying to trace uh, C.C. Uh, Wright's father, and uh, he he came to the conclusion, and he's he's probably correct that C.C. Wright's father was a fellow by the name of James Wright, who um, was a, himself something of a numismatist, and he was from Edinburgh, Scotland, and he uh, wrote the. Uh, preface to James Condor's book on provincial tokens. Now, the reason that's interesting, I guess, is Charles Lennox Wright is convinced that there's a genetic and or a cellular component to C.C. Uh, Wright's artistic talent and his interest in metals. So it became very important for him to establish C.C. Uh, Wright's father, who, who it was. Um, well, C.C. Wright's father was married in Edinburgh and apparently fled with a friend of his name by the name of Millar, M-I-L-L-A-R, not Miller, M-I-L-L-A-R. And uh, Millar was a, a, a professor, I guess, in Edinburgh and was not particularly um, kind to the king. And apparently he was persecuted and fled Edinburgh to America, and James Wright accompanied him, leaving his wife uh, pregnant in Edinburgh. Uh, and the child, um, who is believed to be C.C. Wright's half sister, who he had never met, of course, was Fanny Wright, Frances Wright, who became Fanny Wright, who was a very early women's activist and uh, widely. Uh, published and regarded, and um, just a, it's just an interesting connection. In any event, they uh, came to America, to Damariscotta, and he's the same age as C.C. Wright's wife, who worked with her mother running a public house. Uh, this would have been um, a rooming house that served food and, and drink, and um, they were the same age and apparently there was chemistry <laughs> and uh, uh, there is a marriage recorded in uh, Biddeford, Maine uh, of a um, 
um, Barker Bryant um, and and James Wright. Um, but for whatever reason, it w he insisted they keep it secret. In any event, they 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 uh, returned to um, to Edinburgh in um, 1794, late in the year 1794, and uh, C. C. Wright was born in May. And whether this is there's probably truth to this. He did an amazing amount of research on the family, and he's pro he's probably right. But I don't think we can say definitively. But it is interesting, though, that his name appears on a number of as the designer of a number of these condor tokens, which I'll call condor tokens. They were really, you know, tradesmen's tokens of of the period, and. Um, C.C. Wright, or not C.C. Wright, James Wright's name as the designer appears on a number of these. And it's interesting that when C.C. Wright died, a number of these tokens were in his possession and, and came to um, family members after his death. So circumstantially, there's a little bit of linkage there. Um, other things that uh, Dunlop, William Dunlop tells us about uh, Charles Cushing Wright's early life is that uh, he he was uh, kind of taken under the wing of a, of a fellow by the name of Charles Cushing. Charles Cushing was a third cousin to his mother, an older gentleman. He was the sheriff of the county and he was a brigadier general. He had been appointed a brigadier general during the Revolutionary War, and he took a liking to Charles Cushing Wright, who eventually adapted his name. He was probably born James Wright, but he took Charles Cushing Wright, Charles Cushing's name and became Charles Cushing Wright. Um, Wright was a classmate of, at Harvard of, um, uh, I'm sorry, Cushing was a classmate at Harvard of John Adams and knew John Adams. They had correspondence. And I suspect that when Cushing took Wright under his care, that he imparted to him a great passion uh, for the nation and the promise of America and, and the, the um, goals and the objectives of the founding fathers and the Revolutionary War, because Charles Cushing Wright through his out his entire life demonstrated a great passion, a patriotic devotion to America. Um, he um, educated Wright in Boston, but then died. Wright had to give up his his uh, schooling, came back to Damariscotta and ended up um, going to work in his uncle, his mother's brother's counting house. Uh, he ran a, uh, a shipyard in, in Damariscotta and Wright went to work for him and they had an agreement that if he was happy with the work and they liked each other, that, that he would take him on as an apprentice and he could move into the business. The problem was, that C.C. Wright lived with the family and the sister-in-law, his aunt, I, I think everybody suspected that he was not, what's the right word, uh, that, that he was born out of wedlock and they, they could not accept him as, as a member of, a, of the family. And so she mistreated him badly and he never really particularly understood why. And so at one point ran away, um, broke his leg, and uh, a few years went by and uh, the War of 1812 started. And he ran away at 16 to enlist in the army. He made his way to Albany. Uh, they, uh, whether it was his age or whether he was too late to join the regiment, whatever it was, they did not accept him in the regiment. So he signed on with a sutler for the 25th uh, regiment, New York Regiment, and uh, for the next year w was involved in uh, following the army uh, out to western New York and um, working for the sutler. 
at the Battle of Stony Creek, he was wounded. Um, apparently, you know, they, they participated in a number of the battles and he was wounded. And um, that was the end of his army career, but he, he did serve for about a year. And after uh, leaving the army, he became an apprentice to a, a silversmith by the name of John Osborne. And uh, his apprenticeship is kind of interesting. I don't think it lasted, but maybe a couple of years. Uh, he says he stayed until he was 21. So he would have been 17, maybe four years. So four years as an apprentice to Osborne. But during that apprenticeship, he uh, came upon a book of engravings by a, a fellow by the name of John Scholes, who was an engraver in New York. And he became so intrigued by it, he decided to teach himself how to engrave. And uh, some of his earliest works are these Masonic certificates that uh, were done in Homer, New York. Um, and uh, these are actually um, so signed. Uh, you can see his signature. Uh, the lower uh, left right here. And um, the fellow's name was um, W.B. Whitney. He did these uh, Masonic certificates and the aprons for a fellow by the name of um, W.B. Whitney. But he ended up having to take Mr. Whitney to court in order to get paid. Um, These are both signed as well. Um, C. Wright sculpted it for W. B. Whitney Homer. So anyway, this is some of his earliest engraving work, and he's essentially self-taught. Before, uh, after, when he turned twenty-one and his apprenticeship ended, he returned to Albany, New York, and this is where Mark, where I think he he began his association with Ralph Rodden. Again, in 1818, Rodden and uh, Vistus Balch were about the only game in town, but Wright engraved this map of the city of Troy, and you can see, whoops, wrong thing. You can see his signature um, right there at, in uh, the corner of that vignette. And I think this association with um, Ralph Rodden began, and there's a family tradition, according to Charles Lennox Wright, that C.C. Uh, Wright was the right of Rodden, Wright, and Hatch. Well, obviously that's not correct. Naziah Wright was the right of, of Rodden, Wright, and Hatch. But I do think that there is a possibility, and, and I'm not able to prove it yet, but I do think there is a possibility that in the earliest years when Ralph Rodden moved to New York, in uh, 1828 and is in the directory as Rodden and Wright. I do think there is a possibility that C.C. Wright partnered with him. Um, well, I'll get into that in a moment. Um, after uh, leaving Albany, he, he went to um, uh, visit Peter Maverick uh, at Maverick's shop in New York. And that's where he met Asher Durand. And several years ago, um, when I was working on the Washington book, I really was trying to figure out the Chowder Club medal. And I came to the conclusion that this was probably C.C. Wright's earliest medallic work. Well, I have to tell you I'm wrong. It's not. It's not C.C. Wright, and uh, it, it turns out that the Washington Market Chowder Club was just what it says it was, a chowder club, a group of guys who liked to eat and march and accompany um, any parade or any event that was taking place. There used to be shooting competitions um, in New York shooting used to be one of the biggest pastimes in America. In, in 1818 and 1820, 1830, it was the equivalent of what golf is today. People 
entered these contests and would shoot every weekend they'd have shooting contests but um the oop, the um the thomas star was a uh, butcher who owned a a a shop in the washington market here in new york and uh the um I think there's a lot more work that can be done on this. You know, we have from these newspaper clippings articles on uh, or names, and I think we can research those names and find out more about the Chowder Club. But in any event, when this met, when the Chowder Club medal first appeared uh, at auction, um, JNT Levick uh, bought um, a couple of them. And then in his later years began to think that they that he had been kind of hoodwinked into paying a lot of money for these metals and that they were modern fabrications. Well, in fact, they were probably struck, you know, in the um, 1840s um, and were not made to deceive anybody in any way, shape or form. But um, anyway, Levick became disenchanted with them. But it's never the, the fact that um, he believed that they were modern uh, forgeries really never affected their value. They always kind of held an interest. And that's because it's an early George Washington medal. So why shouldn't it be of, of a high value? Anyway, after leaving um, Albany, coming to New York, he reported uh, to uh, Peter Maverick's shop looking for work. There was no work available to him. Asher Durand had just finished his apprenticeship and had taken over as the managing partner of, um, of uh, Peter Maverick's office. Maverick then moved to his farm in New Jersey and was working there. And uh, Durand was running his shop in New York. Well, Wright met another apprentice of Peter Maverick, so a fellow by the name of William Smith, William D. Smith, and they decided to enter into a partnership and move to um, Savannah, Georgia, and Charleston, South Carolina, where they opened their engraving um, enterprise. Smith only remained with them until about 1821, and uh, in 1820, there was a great fire in Savannah, Georgia a third or a half of the entire city was wiped out, including C.C. Wright's shop in Savannah. So he relocated uh, to Charleston. But while he was in Savannah, he created what I think is the first medallic work that he had done. And that is this seal uh, for a, a notary public by the name of N.H. Olmsted. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure what the significance of the Cupid on the lion is. That's a pretty traditional old um, uh, kind of a mythological uh, image. Uh, Cupid on the lion has been around since the, you know, 1500s, I think. So, so I'm not quite sure what that was all about. But uh, this uh, turned up not too long ago at um, uh, the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts in Winston-Salem. And I believe this is his first engraved uh, medallic work. The, um, that simply reads, the writing on top of the case simply reads, C.C. Wright, Copper Plate Engraver, Savannah, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina. So anyway, Charleston burn. I mean, um, Savannah Burns, he moves to Charleston and uh, William D. Smith leaves the company and goes back to New York. And uh, he creates, while there, another of his very early medallic works. This is a seal uh, of General um, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. Pinckney was a great, um, Charleston, South Carolina resident, very famous, very well known general during the Civil War. He ran for president a couple of times and uh, Wright made this seal from him. We're not really sure. It's, it's not great work. If you, if you really look at this, uh, it, it's very early. It, it's almost cartoonish in its appearance. 
So it's not uh, some of his best work. Later, um, after, well, Pink, Pinckney died. There's, I got to tell the story in, in about 18, in about 1830, I think it was, Len, where there was a, an article in one of the New York newspapers where uh, somebody made the statement that C.C. Wright was the first native-born American to carve a portrait in steel. And somebody in Philadelphia in the newspaper replied, oh, no way. The first person to carve a portrait in steel was Christian Gobrecht. And then the New York paper, a little battle going back and forth, the New York paper replied, no, no, no. C.C. Wright was carving these medals back in 1820, and, and Mr. Gorbrecht agrees with this. So, but the bottom line is that I, I think that C.C. Wright was carving medals in brass and not in, in uh, steel, and that Gorbrecht really is entitled to that di distinction. But for whatever reason, this seemed important to C.C. Wright, that he be identified as the first native-born American uh, to carve a, a portrait in steel. Um, by the way, this is uh, this seal is here in the ANS collection. I think it was given by um, Wait Raymond probably in the 1940s or something. Um, this, I believe, is kind of a modern fabrication. I think this is probably the work of Thomas Elder. I think that. Um, this die, the reverse die showing the um, date of death for um, Pinckney indicates that this was made at a much later date than the original seal. Uh, there are two or three of these in the collection at the um, Smithsonian. I'm not, I'm not sure if there's one here at the ANS or not. I, I should double check that. And uh, there was one, I believe, in the John Ford collection that that sold. So it's out there somewhere. But there are probably, you know, five or six of these known. Uh, they were cast. Um, obviously, they they were not struck. To strike them would have damaged the die. I don't think you would want to try to strike something with a with a brass die. I think it would be too too risky. So in any event, uh, this I think is a, a Thomas Elder production. Um, the image on the left uh, was a lead cast, which I think could be uh, contemporary to when the piece was made. And the one on the right is a little confusing. It's a uh, plaster impression, but the die is different. You can see that the uh, lettering around the the top is is different whereas that's enclosed in a band and there are no stars but and but the lettering is is much further around the die so anyway it's just an interesting entity it turned up in a melnick sale in the 1980s and sold for 22 bucks i wish i'd been collecting back then i would have bid 23 for it so um in charleston south carolina it, it, this gives a demonstration of some of his engraving uh, ability. Um, the, this is a rather attractive vignette. Um, th this was from the uh, directory in Charleston at 1821. And I blew up here. This one looks pretty nice from a distance, but I blew it up. And I think there are all kinds of problems with it. it it's proportionally just, um, I mean, look at the size of, of her thigh and the length and the uh, entire uh, shape of her arms. N none of it's terribly proportional. The neck, it's, it's so it's not a great uh, piece of engraving, but he definitely got better. And uh, in 1823, he traveled to New York, and I don't know if he attended the race or not, but have any of you ever heard of American Eclipse, the, the racehorse American Eclipse? This is one of the greatest racehorse stories in, in, a, in American history. Uh, Eclipse was um, 
the sot was the the son of uh, a horse by the name of Duroc, and Eclipse never lost um, never lost a race. Interestingly, back in 1823, there was a match race. The Union course in New York had just reopened. New York had a law; it was against the law to horse race, but a number of wealthy people uh, were able to. Um, persuade the legislature to overturn the law and they they opened the union race course and uh, Eclipse kind of showed everybody what what a great horse he was and somebody from the south said we have to have a match race and think about this in 1821 they put up a purse of ten thousand dollars to to run a match race between Eclipse and a horse by the name of Sir Henry. And these match races were incredible, nothing like what you see today. These horses would run four mile courses three times in a day. Think about that. Today, they, they run what, a mile and a quarter, a mile and a half? The Preakness is what, a mile and a half? Um, and they were running four mile courses in three of them in a day, and the, and the best of three was the winner of, of the match. So this became a huge event, event in New York. Thousands of people turned out for the event, and Eclipse won. He, he did lose one of the, uh, one of the uh, legs, but he, he won two of them, and Sir Henry might not have finished the third one. And it was a huge big deal, and, uh, you know, Van Zant <laughs> won the $10,000 purse, and he hired uh, a fellow by the name of Alvin Fisher to come and paint his great horse. And Alvin Fisher came and did six studies of uh, Eclipse, and C.C. Uh, Wright and Asher Durand were invited to come and make engravings of the paintings. So in 1820, this is C.C. Wright's engraving of the painting and it's really pretty good and uh he sold these and they were very popular uh and he would advertise them and sell them and um did very very well with them shortly after that he left charleston he well before i get into that he while he was in charleston he met and married his wife uh lavinia simon Simons Wright. Now, while he was in Charleston, South Carolina, he got involved in uh, organizing this uh, South Carolina uh, Art Society, um, and one of and he was uh, on the board of directors of that society with some pretty impressive people. Um, Joel Poinsett, for example, who was at one point Andrew Jackson's Secretary of State was uh, on, on the board with C.C. Wright, as was a fellow by the name of Charles Simons, who was the cousin of Lavinia Simons, who uh, Charles C. Wright married. She was 15 years old. He was 21 or something, 22. She was really too young to be married. Her mother objected to it. And it was kind of, her mother didn't even attend the wedding and it was not a happy, event and uh, but in in any event while um, uh, she became pregnant immediately and they had a child and the child died in their first year its first year of life which was rather sad uh, but during the year 1823 he began to plan a move back to New York where he partnered with Cyrus Durand, who was Asher Durand's brother. Cyrus had invented a machine called the geometric lathe number three. And uh, by 1823, he was on the fourth iteration, geometric lathe number four. And that lathe enabled them to engrave all of these um, complex geometric patterns that really played a large part in uh, security printing um, over the next, well, 100 years. Um, but th these were some of the earliest uh, notes done. Interestingly, at the same time, um, 
Asa Spencer and um, Jacob Perkins invented a, a machine, a geometric lathe that did pretty much the same thing. There is a big difference in the way the two systems operated. One of them was large table size. The other one was small and portable. Uh, theirs worked by uh, acid etching where they would engrave, acid etch, engrave, acid etch, and eventually get the shadings and toning. But in any event, this was something new in the banknote business, and they became hugely successful. Now, John Durand, who was Asher Durand's son, uh, wrote a biography of his father, Asher Durand, and he speaks of this period, and he kind of contradicts himself in the book. At one point, he says it was not very profitable for them, but at another point in the book, he says that he was able to buy his house outright based on the income that they made. And because of that income, uh, they... Uh, Charles Wright was able to, um, oh, well, before I get into that, <laughs> while they were in partnership, um, Madison sent his invitation to James, or sorry, James Monroe sent his in invitation to Lafayette to come and visit America. And uh, this became a very, a very big event. And, um, and uh, Wright, Durand and Wright, whoops, I keep the, um, engraved uh, the invitation to the FET. The Mrs. Wright on this invitation is probably not C.C. Wright's wife. It's probably Silas Wright's wife, who was governor of New York. And um, these, this is a pair of gloves done for um, Lafayette's visit that was actually an engraving by C.C. Wright. And they were loosely based on, on one of these early portraits of, of Lafayette. I haven't been able to find the exact one yet, but it'll show up eventually. Uh, this metal let is very famous. Everybody knows the uh, Washington and uh, uh, Lafayette um, pendant metal with on each side. And for many years, it was believed that this was done by Charles Cushing Wright. Uh, William Elliott Woodward attributed it to him in the McCoy sale in 1864. And that attribution had kind of held in place until I think about 1990. I'm not sure when John Kleberg wrote his essay on this, but Kleberg did a great job in, in tracking down uh, the, the fact that uh, this was probably made by a fellow named Joseph Lewis. And, and, and Joseph Lewis advertised them widely in the New York papers for the, for the event in uh, Lafayette's um, visit in New York for, in Castle Gardens. They had the great fete. But recently, um, Ron Gamble and John Connor uh, and I, I kind of I do agree with them on this, that the actual um, object that was being advertised was probably this oval metalette, because none of the advertisements actually mention Washington, and they all mention Lafayette, uh, and they mention him in silver and gold. So I think Camel, uh, Gamel and Conor have done a great job in identifying this, and that this is probably the Joseph Lewis um metalette that was created for the castle garden fet and not the um uh, the the one that's been accepted but gamel and connor where i kind of disagree with them is that they believed that that metalette was actually made by richard trested and they kind of base their assumption on this oval uh, Bolivar, I mean, uh, Simon Bolivar medal. And at one point, Trested made a copy of Davalos's medal of Simon Bolivar. And uh, they, they believe because it's an oval, I guess, that it, it, it that Trested made this medal. But I actually think they're wrong there. I think this is, uh, I think, I do think this is the work of Joseph Lewis and that this is the medal that was advertised for the Grand Fete. 
So what is this medal, the, the Lafayette Washington Medal? Well, there's an interesting note in uh, the Thomas Sale of the James B. Longacre collection. And in that note, it said, the dies for these medallions and counter stamps, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> it says, uh, uh, struck during the visit of Lafayette to Philadelphia. Very fine, extremely rare. So I do believe that they were struck at the U.S. Mint. The, the counter stamps were struck at the U.S. Mint, that they were engraved by a, uh, a die sinker by the name of Persico, and that um, years um, over the years, those dies left the mint, and that these metals were restrikes, or, or not restrikes, but these metals were probably made after the fact, after Lafayette's visit, and or they might have been made and sold for the fete that was held in Philadelphia. But there, there's there's evidence to suggest that Persico was paid for a set of dies, although it's not delineated what that set of dies was. And I think Dave Bowers first noticed this um, in one of his early um, studies of this thing. So in any event, it's not C.C. Wright. That, that's the point I'm, I'm trying to make. Uh, and when you look at the two portraits, uh, obviously the one on the left is superior to the, to the one on the right. But in any event, um, I think they, they, these came out of the U.S. Mint in Philadelphia. But Lafayette did, I mean, Lafayette, Messi C. Wright did cut a Lafayette medal. In 1824, a fellow by the name of Campfield thought it would be a good idea to create a bunch of buttons um, with Lafayette's image on them. And so th there's a fellow by the name of Archibald Robertson, who was uh, to numismatists probably known as the designer of the Erie Canal Medal, but he was also the designer of the Thomas Truxton Medal. And Archibald Robinson was at that time, I think, president or vice president of the American uh, Art, uh, the American uh, Art Association or the Art Institute of what? Um, and he arranged a meeting uh, with Lafayette and a young sculptor by the name of John Frizee. And Frizee was a, a bit of a brash young man. He, he, he was incredibly talented. And, and if there's a, um, a uh, self-portrait that he did of himself in, in Marvel really talented individual. Uh, his sculptures at the uh, Boston Athenaeum are, are just stunning, just absolutely amazing. He died very young, unfortunately, but Frizee got into Lafayette's presence and looked at him and said, are you wearing a wig? And Lafayette said, yes, I am, I'm bald. And Frizee, right on the spot, persuaded him to remove his wig and allow him to do a um, a mask, a, uh, a what, what they call the life mask, and uh, th so they did set an appointment. For Z came back, they did a life mask, and you have to understand this is a horrible process. I mean, it takes hours, and you're laying there, and they're putting this stuff on your face. It sticks to your face, and it's it's just awful. But Lafayette graciously allowed him to make this mask it was for Z's intention to create a a marble sculpture from which he could then make plaster casts that he would sell to the public and capitalize and make a lot of money uh, but during Lafayette's tour uh, Lafayette also did masks for a fellow by the name of Nicholas Gavalot and one for Isaac Henry Brauer and so Frazee got a little bit annoyed, <laughs> and we're not sure what happened to his mask of Lafayette. So they, they, there, there are no known examples of, of Frazee's Lafayette bust in existence. 
So in the 1980s, when the Smithsonian did a, a, um, a retrospective of John Frazee's work, they couldn't find an example of the Lafayette mask, and they used a medal or a button done by C.C. Wright as part of the exhi exhibition. So this is the closest thing we have uh, to what Lafayette actually looked like when he visited America in 1824. Now, he was 67 years old when he visited America in 1824. And uh, so Scoville made these buttons in three sizes, but the bust is the same size. So there was only one bust punch made. 15, 17, and 21 millimeters. And even though this isn't a great photograph, this says WTFT, right? Fetch it. Um, and uh, Campfield wasn't really thrilled with this button. He kind of thought, you know, Lafayette looks a little scary in this. How am I going to sell a lot of buttons? And so he persuaded Wright to soften the portrait whoops, and make it, uh, make it a little bit more palatable. And so this, this is what Wright came up with, but he did not sign it. Uh, but the evidence that it's still his work is this medal, where, um, you know, the, the uh, portrait is, as you can see, pretty much, pretty much the same. So this is one of Wright's very earliest work done. These buttons were made by Scoville. The easiest way to tell the difference, by the way, is that um, this button uh, reads extra on the back. Uh, this button reads extra rich on the back right here. So um, these are incredibly rare, but they're, they're uh, CC Wright. So Oops, I keep going the wrong way here. And this is just something I'm throwing in because I think it's interesting. But this is an invoice. Richard Trested um, made many, many buttons for, for Scoville. And the, the reason this is important is that um, after Wright left, Durand and Wright and and went on his own. He took the money he made from that partnership in the banknote business, and he bought uh, Trested's shop and and uh, inventory. And uh, Trested died in 1829 uh, from an infection. He amputated his finger, I guess, accidentally. He put it through. Um, Eric's machine or something like that and, <laughs> and lost his finger and he died from the infection at the age of 29 and the the uh, thing is is that the button was struck pretty much under his supervision and that's how Wright came to know about Trested um, and when Trested died Wright um, bought the um, uh, shop and form the partnership with um, James Bale, who had been Trusted's apprentice. So Wright and Bale was formed. So I, I wanted to jump and talk a little bit about the um, type of work that was being done in New York at, at that time. In the eighteen, here's eighteen twenty four, the election uh, buttons or the election. Uh, things that were made for Andrew Jackson. And, and what I'd like you to notice about this stuff is how, it, I mean, it's charming in its, in its folk art kind of way, but it's crude work. There's no great work on any of these buttons. Uh, we don't know who the makers were. Trusted could have been one of them. Um, there are other engravers in New York. You can find them in the directory, but there were very few die sinkers listed in the directory in 1824. Um, Robert Lovett was not back in New York until a couple of years later. Uh, so we jump forward to 1828. And again, we, we kind of see the crudeness of, of the work 
that that was being done. Here are more uh, from 1828, and um, this this token right here is of particular interest. This token here where it says democracy prevails throughout the union was uh, probably the actual one that was made for the election. Back in 1824, that was the first year that the public, that there was actually a popular election where the public was allowed to vote. Now, the public didn't actually select the president, but they were allowed to vote in 1824. What was interesting about 1824, it was really one of the last years of a generation of uh, Revolutionary War heroes. Um, the founding fathers were, were really getting to the end of their, their lives, and um, the veterans of, um, of the war uh, were were fading fast. And so this was probably the first election where the candidates, 1824, were not Revolutionary War veterans. Um, but in any event, um, Jackson won the popular vote. And he won what's called a plurality, which simply means he got the majority of the vote, but he didn't get the 51% majority he received more votes than the other candidates. So many people felt like Jackson had been robbed and he kind of was in a way, but um, I don't want to get into it too much. But um, one of the things is that Trested did advertise uh, for Jackson Medal. So, so uh, I believe that, that this medal right here is the trusted metal because when you look at trusted's work eagles are what he was good at uh, portraits not so much the the jackson is eh, it's okay but it's not great uh, but eagles are what he really excelled at and um, then all of a sudden in 1832 something changes and and we have a halfway decent portrait of Andrew Jackson. And here's a halfway decent portrait of Andrew Jackson. This is probably the work of Christian Gobrecht in 1834 or, and, or 1832. And here is um, a decent portrait of Andrew Jackson. In the 1990s, a fellow by the name of Wesley Cox did a lot of research on the um, butt letter punches. And he was able to link this portrait or this, this medal of Jackson to uh, this store card of Wright and Bale. And um, really the letters do line up when you do photo overlays. Uh, and the and the leaves, the the oak leaves um, in the um, uh, wreath uh, line up with with some of these leaves over here, and and so we're pretty certain that the Jackson medal is the work of Wright and Bale, and the portrait is probably C. C. Wright. Now it's not signed. C.C. C. Wright was not a Jackson fan. He, he was a Henry Clay fan. But all of a sudden in the election of 1832, uh, we, we have Henry Clay running for president again, and we have these two great medals right here. Uh, here is the uh, die, here's the reverse from that previous um, Jackson Medal, advocate of the American system. And it's now on a Henry Clay Medal. But here's a portrait of Henry Clay that doesn't look anything like Henry Clay. But when you go back to 1832 and search for a portrait of Henry Clay, you have a hard time finding one until uh, later in the year where where a portrait turns up and this one matches a little bit better and this medal is signed on the truncation wtft right fetch it so uh we know that this 
medal right here is Henry Clay, but uh, these other two DeWitt assigned to Wright, but they, they really are not. They're, they're probably later productions and they're definitely not the work of C.C. Wright. Henry Clay was the advocate of the American system. So anyway, these medals, um, it shows that something's changed. The quality of the work is getting better from, from the previous Jackson and, and um, Clay medals. Uh, and I believe that this great Whig victory, this is 1834, so if you go back to the, the midterm election of 1834, uh, you, you would be hard pressed to find the Whig that won an election. But if you dig into it very closely, 14 of the 15 aldermen in New York were Whig party members. They lost the mayoral race, but they basically felt they gained control of the city because 14 of the aldermen were Whigs. And again, when we do the letter punch linkage, they, they match, they line up, they line up with other uh, C.C. Wright medals. So I'm pretty convinced that this is a C.C. Wright, Wright and Bale production. This symbol obviously was used on Mexican coinage as early as 1820. Uh, 1826 or 1822, something like that. Um, but I also think it became the model uh, for the first steam coinage or the inspiration. Not, not that Gobrecht copied it or anything, but I have a feeling somebody, uh, Franklin um, Peel or Robert Patterson came to Gobrecht and said, we like this, give us a liberty cap metal freedom the the idea of the steam press would provide freedom um workmen um be freed up but in any event the the letters do line up uh, if i had 20 of each of these to compare i'm sure we could find you, you know le letters that matched perfectly uh it's difficult to get them to all, oops to all match perfectly because you know shifting or or you know, the impact of the dies, but um, in any event, th this is, I am absolutely convinced, uh, the work of Wright and Bale. Moving forward, uh, Beck's Bath. Here's an interesting uh, store card from 1832. This is right in the wheelhouse of Wright and Bale. This is their peak time, 1829 to 1833, the period of Wright and Bale. And here's a, a woman at the bath, and it's a little bit racy, obviously, uh, so it's not signed. But this is the statue on which it was probably based. And the, uh, when this statue uh, was, a uh, sculpture, I should say, was um, created, um, the, um, school of design that um you know i don't know why my brain stopped working but the um uh the uh school for the arts of design and I'll, I'll come up with the name in a moment but they imported one of them to study and and so uh cc wright by the way was one of the founding members of the national academy for the arts of design sorry and um and he was one of the founding members and they imported one of these statues for study and I can't help but think that he created this token uh, and of course the letter punches and and the rosettes match other work of Wright and Bale so I assigned this one to them as well. Um, here are a few others uh, the the Fuchtwanger store card uh, Fuchtwanger uh, relocated in New York from his previous address to 377 Broadway in 1832. And what a, what a better time to bring out a new store card. Uh, Squire and Merritt relocated to their address on South Street in that period, 1832, 1833. Uh, same with uh, Charles Webb and, and Congress Hall here. Um, 
and uh, and then the um, Ruggles gold beater. If you do photo overlays with the letters with all of these tokens, they all line up with Wright and Bale with products coming from the Wright and Bale shop. So uh, I, I just think that these are well, I don't know that they're overlooked, but I do think that uh, it's important to know what shop they came out of. So another uh, to or metal that's been widely, um, I guess we're not sure where it comes from, but 1834, um, who was doing portrait work like this? There were only three people in America who were doing work like this. It was C.C. Wright, Christian Gobrecht, and Moritz First. And uh, being in New York, um, and this just has the look and feel of Wright's work, but to, to prove it, um, you see the um, calumet and the, and the peace pipes. Um, by the way, what this was all about is uh, the American Fur Company in, in uh, 1832, um, John Jacob Astor sold it to his, uh, to, uh, his um, co-workers and, and uh, they were not getting the metals from the government, the peace metals from the government to distribute. And, um, and, it, and it was a problem, and they were writing to the War Department and to Lewis Cass, and we need the medals. And finally, the War Department said, okay, you have permission to give medals to the Indians, but um, you, must, you must call them trinkets. You must call them um, souvenirs. You must call them anything but medals, uh, because only the U.S. government can give medals to the Indians. So... What, what happened is they, uh, at that time, C.C. Wright in 1830 had created this great medal of Washington copied from the Amadeus Durand uh, medal of Washington. And they were cutting the heads out of the medal, planing them down and affixing them to a blank planchet. But then the reverse of the planchet was that die right there and um then they were uh the two sh the two shells or or uh discs were joined together around the rim and we know there is an example of this here this metal right here in the ans collection and we know that they were giving uh these to the indians because uh in i forget what year but uh in Red River, um, Montana, uh, they were building a highway and they had to move an Indian graveyard and they dug up several Indians. They exhumed the bodies and it, and it was a big ceremony. They did it the right way. They did everything they could. And one of the Indians they exhumed had this medal um, in, in his grave with him. And um, so we know that these medals were given. So the fact that we have Wright's head here, the same reverse is on the Astor medal. This is a medal done by James Bale, uh, where they cut the head off his Lafayette medal and fixed it and kind of did the same treatment. So I think it's a pretty safe bet to say that the um, um, John Jacob Astor medal came from the Wright and Bale shop. I'd also say that uh, these were made on cast planchets, the, the silver metal, uh, which is something that C.C. Wright basically hated. He hated the fact in the 1830s that he had to work on cast planchets. Uh, here's another portrait from the uh, 1830, about 1835, 1836. Now, this has been attributed variously uh, um, at some point, somebody attributed dyes by Lander, but Louisa Lander, who was a sculptor, would have been something like uh, 11 years old when, when this metal was struck. So we're pretty sure it was not her. Uh, she, she's an interesting story in, in and of herself. She was a, a friend of Nathaniel Hawthorne's and kind of got into trouble 
over in, in Europe because apparently she posed nude for a sculptor over there. And that became something of a scandal for the artists over there that she wasn't the right kind of woman. And so Hawthorne stopped associating with her. You know? <laughs> and then uh, in a Bangs Merwin catalog, somebody attributes it to Ponthon, uh, who is a die sinker um, in, in London. But in fact, um, if, if you read the catalog carefully, uh, it, it's probably a typo in that the lot number, uh, the two last numbers of the lot number are, are transcribed. And when you look at the other lot number, those were all Ponthon metal. So it's very unlike, it's just that attribution is the result of a typo in the catalog. Uh, but the portrait, again, now this is after the Wright and Bale period, but the portrait is very probably by C.C. Wright. Not, not the rest of it. This is probably James Bale, but the portrait, C.C. Wright. Um, after Wright and Bale, um, he went in partnership again with Cyrus Durand, and they began to do very interesting uh, woodblock engravings. This is the cover of a book that they did, The Lady's Companion. You can see the signature right there. Uh, they issued a number of very large um, posters with very elaborate engraving around the rim. And if you look at the print, uh, it's a complete text of Washington's farewell address. They did the Declaration of Independence. They also did the Constitution. And these three things were advertised uh, in the New York uh, papers and um, See how I'm doing on time. Oh, I'm good, I think. Uh, then they joined, um, he, he uh, formed a, a company to produce steel pens. And he became the manufacturer of steel pens. And again, became incredibly successful. These promotional notes were issued in 1843 to 1847. And uh, there are many engravings done by Wright. And uh, the, he sold the pen company in 1847, made a pile of money doing it, and was able to um, then kind of just become a die sinker and, and metal sculptor full time. Now, this metal, I, I just wanted to put this up here. Am I out of time, Jesse? If I Oh, okay. Well, let me just, sorry, let me just say that um, th this metal, uh, the, the portrait is by, um, is by uh, a Mr. Brown of Brooklyn, New York, uh, but um, it says that the dyes were executed by uh, Mr. Wright of New York, that the plaster model for it was not successful and they had to have a second one made, but that the dies were then made by uh, Charles Cushing Wright. And to move real quickly, I was gonna finish with the Patterson medal. And should I, should I do that or should I just shut up? All right, so this is a misunderstood medal. And I'd like to kind of tell the story very quickly. When Adam Eckfeldt retired, he was beloved at the Mint. There is no question. They raised a lot of money. They struck a medal. They gave it to Adam Edfield. He was entitled to it. He ran the metal business there at the Mint, and I think he took care of the workers who helped him with it, and, and they really appreciated him. But Franklin Peel, who, who was the great mechanic, brought all the good technology to the Mint, was not beloved by the people that worked for him. Because when he ran the metal business, I don't think he was taking care of them. I don't think he was kind of paying them to, to the work. And uh, so the portrait was done by C.C. Wright, probably at the request of Franklin Peel. So this side of the medal, okay, fairly self-explanatory. But this side of the medal, I think, is really, really interesting. The, the serpent eating its tail, the Ouroboros, did I say that right, Chris? Yes. Ouroboros. Awesome. All right. Um, was used previously uh, on 
Winfield Scott Medal in the War of 1812. Well, they thought they saved some money and, and we're going to save some money. We have the hub, so we're, we're just going to reuse it on, on the Patterson Medal. It got into the news. People were horrendously offended by the fact that they would reuse this and, and there was scandal. It, it's a tempest in a teapot, but there were, there were news and, and Patterson and, and Franklin received a lot of criticism. But to make matters worse, um, there was a fellow at the Mint by the name of Richard uh, McCullough, who developed a method for parting silver from gold. And he created a big scandal and stink at the Mint. Franklin Peel hated him. They had a big battle. It eventually ended with Robert Patterson retiring before giving the, the opportunity to retire before this got into the media. And eventually Franklin Peel, I think, was fired from the, the Mint. But uh, McCulloch's method for parting silver from gold may or may not have worked effectively, but it became a big scandal. So I think that this whole thing is a tongue in cheek joke on the part of Franklin Peel to Robert Patterson saying, here's, here's a, parting, a parting token, interesting wording, parting silver from gold, a parting token. And here's, we've used a, what W. Eliot Woodward called your favorite snake on, on the reverse of, of the metal. And so I, I think then suddenly we have a medal for Adam Eckfeld, we have a medal for Patterson, and James Ross Snowden's ego was so big that he had to have a medal when he retired, and that's when they decided to make the whole series of Mint Director medals. And, and so I, I'll finish on that note. There's more I could say about this, but I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you.